Hey everybody, welcome to the fifth installment of the PUSH webinar series. Uh, we're all very excited for today's uh, guest, Simon, Church of the Ospreys. He's a fantastic guy and we've been working together for, for quite some time, so I'm really excited to hear about how he's implemented the system. Before we get things going, we at PUSH would like to make a special announcement. We've officially partnered with Absolute Performance uh, in the United Kingdom to help us distribute it in the United Kingdom. So thank you uh, to Tony and, and Jack from Absolute Performance. If you're interested in uh, getting synced up with them, you can look them up at aperformance.co.uk or jack at aperformance.co.uk. And with, without further ado, I'd like to pass things off to Simon. Uh, for all of you listening, just go ahead and punch your questions in on the QA. We'll answer the best that we can, and then we'll open it up for a round table right at the end. So thank you, Simon. Thank you. Let's see if we get on to my... Cool. We can we can see your uh, your screen, Simon. So you're good to go. Okay. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, firstly, you know, welcome to the seminar. Uh, thank you for myself. This is my first uh, webinar or uh, and, and podcast, really, in terms of talking about how we implement the push system at uh, Ospreys. Uh, so, so thanks for that. Uh, apologies first uh, if you don't quite understand my accent. I'm from South Wales, so if I need to slow down or be a little bit clear on things, please don't hesitate. Just give me a shout on that, and I'll either repeat or or go over things. Um, just to break into the, the presentation, really we're gonna focus on the majority of the presentation will be based on uh, performance program, the Ospreys, um, what we do, how we do it, and, and why we do it, uh, especially in our, you know, the difference between our pre-season and our in-season blocks. Um, and then we look at how, since bringing uh, push into the program, so as Bailey said, uh, I spoke to Bader, been, been in touch with Bailey the last few seasons, how we're gonna implement the push program, uh, first of all, the, the devices and then actually into the portal the last year or so. How we implement that into our system and how it's made our system a lot more um, efficient, really, in terms of how we run our process um, and, and how we run our performance program as a whole, not just talking S&C, but also our return to play, our physiotherapy and medical side, and obviously our rugby side as well. Uh, so just in terms of my role, um, Head of Physical Performance at Ospreys Rugby. Uh, it's my first season in that role. Prior to that, it's one of the last six seasons as a senior strength and conditioning coach, uh, professional rugby uh, in, in Wales with Dragons Rugby for five seasons and my second season here with the Ospreys. Uh, so my role now, oversee all the strength and conditioning programme and also uh, how our sports science integrates into that and how everything performance-wise feeds into our rugby environment as well. So first of all, I'd like to talk about, you know, our philosophy as a department. This not only goes through our um, coaching philosophy but also what we want our athletes to be, to know where they are in terms of our performance pathway. This starts very much from you know, where our under 16s are. So under 16s come into our environment. They know what we're about in terms of a region, um, but they also know that their first step onto that performance pathway from an athlete, but also our coaches, is our education, nutrition, and training. So before that strength underpins, you know, we talk about getting players um, used to one, being in our environment, but understanding our coaching process, our education regarding nutrition and, and how we're going to train. As our players move through that pathway into our under-18 system, then they come into that strength and the pins. So when we talk about and think about demands of our game, uh, players fundamentally need to be strong enough and robust enough to back up games. It's probably one of the only sports which is dominated by a huge collision, but also guys need to be able to run and, and be mobile across the field. Strength is only going to underpin that. So it's our first step into our performance pathway for our athletes. As we move through that, so under 18 system, we look at power dominates and speed kills. If we look at rugby as a sport, what has key moments or our KPIs of our sport, are always things are again over a game line or evasive running or footwork or um, have an out and out pace to beat defenders. And our key moments in the game are always defined by that. So this, this for us just defines our philosophy and our programming and our pathway, not only from an athlete perspective, from a coaching perspective, which underpins in our structure, our process, our objectives, and also our measures to what we want to create within our environment. Also, players know what they're getting when we say strength underpins, power dominates, the speed kills in terms of going from you know, that, you know, our first steps into our environment to our top international players, obviously, who are currently preparing for a World Cup campaign as well. So if we just, for, for those who um, 
obviously you know, we get a lot of guys sign up for the, for the webinar. Some might not be so experienced in terms of uh, our rugby environment. So just look at the physical demands of what our game are. It's probably one of those, it's touched upon one of those games that one, we've got to cover a huge amount of running, but also it's a highly collision sport. So it's dominated by high impacts of contact. So in terms of how we're programming for our athletes and what we're trying to create, we've got you know, two ends of a spectrum. We've got a tight head prop who is 130K, 108K of lean mass. And then we've got an outside back who is 85K. who has got a, you know, a max velocity of 10.4 meters per second. So we've got a huge spectrum of athletes. We've got a coach and up to 40 to 50 athletes within the squad as well. So if we look at that, fundamentally what we need to prepare them for, uh, season demands for us, this is a little bit different this year, purely because um, our season started a little bit later. So it's the first time since I've been working in rugby, so my seventh pre-season now, um, we've had the luxury of having a 12-week 12, 12 pre-season, uh, but it also means it's a long season for the players. So look, an 11-month uh, uh, season, including our pre-season, 32 games uh, across two competitions. That could actually go up to 36 games. Uh, we our game demand, so... Players are going to get through if they play the 80 minutes between 6,000 and 8.5 thousand meters with up to 20 tackles, 50 to 20 carries, hitting 20 plus rucks um, for our our centers and our ball carriers. Those carries could be could be higher than that as well. So looking at those game demands, we can see that in terms of a spectrum, what what we gotta um, create in terms of athletes is huge. Um, even with our training week demands, you know, players need to train and need to be robust enough to back up training weeks. Just to give you an idea, we'll get through between 16 to 21k weeks. Um, if it's a longer turnaround, obviously that does go up a little bit. Um, depending on the, if the players are playing, we've got three to four gym sessions, uh, two to three um, speed sessions, uh, rugby sessions and unit sessions. So unit sessions for us, if we've got um, forwards, so we've got tight deads, uh, loose heads, hookers, uh, second rows and back rowers. Those guys will have separate scrum line-up sessions um, as well as the rugby. So you can see this, there's multiple fatiguing factors within our program. Uh, what also doesn't come into this is analysis. So the players do a lot of analysis outside and general fatiguing factors. We all know life comes into that as well. So in terms of what we need to um, be really clinical with in terms of our programming, uh, that just makes it evident in terms of um, everything we need to take into account regarding not just our performance program um, but also our rugby program and how, how those interlink. With this, it goes into our program, you know, big rocks. So, touch base on it when we go through our uh, in season program, what we're looking to get from our players. So, big bang for our buck regarding our movements for our programming to ensure we do a training where we need to train for the players to go out and, and perform optimally. So, this is how we structure our weeks. Um, and within the presentation, I'm going to be completely transparent in terms of what we do, um, let you know what we do, how we do it, why we do it. Um, there's certain things, obviously, in terms of data, I won't uh, be able to put out, but there's a lot that I'll, I'll be looking to put out and go into depth. So if any, anyone wants to touch base on that, I could come back to it. Uh, we work up a high day, low day approach. So everyone would have you know, seen that or come across that in terms of the Charlie Francis approach to training. The reason we do that is because like, we can manage our fatigue and our stimulus. Um, so we don't get two days of the same. Um, within that, you know, what doesn't dictate that is volume. We ensure that what is dictated by that is our intensity. And in pre-season, um, and we're carrying it through to our season now, is that we can ensure the stimulus we're giving to players each day. So if we look at our internal load and our wellness, um, you can see where if you look at the, the, first, the uh, fourth column from the left, the 1st of July, this is actually some of our data from this year, is that when we can look at our internal load, so when guys' RPEs are up and our wellness is up, we know the next day when our RPEs are down, so our internal load, our wellness and our soreness can, are going to be coming down as well. Uh, so we can start manipulating. As you can see, our internal load goes from high to low. That just shows us what we're programming um, and what we think we're getting before we program in is, is essentially what we're going to get back. It's ensuring that we're getting what we, we think we're getting from the program, but also we're getting the right stimulus that players can go high on one day, they can come in the next day. We still get our, our low force, low speed day the next day, which is really important. But then it means that we can go high again the, the day after. As you can see then for our internal load and our soreness, you know, from a day where we got 
um, high internal loads looking at RPs, eights and nines, we know the next day our guy is going to be sore, but the next day we can bring their internal load down. So we can just manipulate our stress for that day to ensure that we're still getting the stimulus we need. Now, what, what again, what we go back to is it's not dictated by volume, this is dictated by intensity. So what we put across to our players at a high day is high speed. So look at a high speed, uh, high force. What goes into that day in terms of our content, and I'll tie in some of our rugby into this as well, is that we dictate everything. So if we go our speed session, our strength and power work will also come into that, uh, our jumps work, and our maximal conditioning. So pre-season for us, with our conditioning, we're tying into that as our, our conditioning games. Uh, so there's a lot of change direction in that, a lot of um, high velocity exposure. So we're looking at line breaks and, and kick checks and so on within those games to ensure that we're still getting some high speed running. But then on the next day, our low day, when we define it as low force, low speed, and low stress, we can ensure that you know we're still going to see the right stimulus for that day. If anything, it's, it's, it's uh, more important than the high day because we can ensure that we're getting our aerobic conditioning, but also still um, being in a position where we're acting as, as our recovery day, still getting a stimulus to ensure that guys are coming in on day three and ready to train high. So what comes into that is our extensive tempo running, upper body strength and power, and our GPP conditioning. So we're looking at once we move through our extensive work into our aerobic power work, which we looked at in our first block. This is just a look at our pre-season blocks. So we're going to be completely transparent with what we do. Um, our players, and again, we have the luxury of having a longer pre-season this year. Uh, so our off-season program or, or our content of what we look to get, uh, our template is top left-hand side. Um, so that was for us accumulation one. This is when the players are actually off off season. Players had five weeks off season, and then uh, the first two weeks were completely off, and then three weeks. Then players had a program sent out to us, and this is where the integration of the portal and push for us was paramount. Because when a player steps out of their environment to go and train for a few weeks, um, unless they've got a unless you've got a way of tracking what they're doing, <clears throat> you're really going to struggle to know what they're going to come back into on day one of preseason. So it's great for us because then players can sign into the portal. Some guys will have their own bands as well. Uh, we're in a position where they can then train and we were getting our instant data and, and our feedback back in with us. Um, we know it was a three-week program, strength endurance, and we get our exposures. So we have 12 gym exposures, six conditioning, which the guys are expected to do outside the environment. Within our um, pre-season, uh, just to go through our philosophy of how we train guys pre-season, we're looking at predominantly a block, traditional block periodization approach. The uh, reason being is that we can completely control our program for, for those 12 weeks. And what I mean by that is that we can control the stimulus, we can control the fatigue and our recovery. So we know what players are going to be coming back into us, uh, like and showed in our last slide in terms of our internal loads, um, because what they haven't got to cope with is game day at the end of the week. So if we look at and this is why it'll change, and I'll talk about when we get into our further slides about in-season programming, is that players are going to completely recover um, differently from a game. Um, so we could get a back rower who's playing on a Friday night and they've got through 20 carries, uh, 15, 20 tackles, they've got through 7.5 k running, um, and they've put a, a huge shift in for us. They're coming back in on Monday morning compared to a player who might play the last 15 minutes who might go through three tackles and two carries. Um, those players are going to be coming back into our environment completely different. And that's why probably in season we'd start with our low day so we can get our recovery day and we can get our conditioning in and then we can start manipulating those days individually for those players. But because we haven't got that during pre-season, we can, we can have players come back and we can be really concentrated in terms of the dose we want to give those players. Like we would be traditionally in, in block periodizations, we still have our, how we program our, our competition exercise, um, our special development of prep, and then our competition, uh, and then our um, GPP exercises as well. What it also enables us to do is during our pre-season is that we could spend longer times in developing, um, especially in our speed blocks, uh, rhythm and rise, and just ensuring that what we were getting from those programs, if you look at our block one, we were looking at just to drive some acceleration, first three step acceleration. It meant that we could spend, you know, seven or eight sessions on that just focusing on developing the guy's ability to drive and project out for those first three steps because we knew we had that time we had the luxury of a, a three-month pre-season um we could really focus on that which you don't normally so pre-season for us so in in uh, rugby unions between six and eight weeks 
So to have a plenty up to six to four or well, four to six weeks on top of that has been a luxury for us really. So that first first block is a four week block, uh, basically looking to improve uh, and enlarge our training capacity. Um, we did that of our high low approach. So our high day would be our speed work, would be our lower body lift, be our lower body lift, uh, and then we come into our our strength endurance block really. Uh, so we got 24 gym exposures within that block, seven speed and 16 conditioning. As we worked into block two, we start to see where our emphasis has changed. We're looking at our games day still stayed this. We spoke about earlier, our, our high day for our conditioning was um, anaerobic games. What we did throughout pre-season is just look to spend and increase our intensity or increase our time spent in intensity during those games based off worst case scenarios, which I'll, I'll touch base on as we get a little bit further into the presentation. For us, that, that second block was slightly, slightly less. It was a three-week block. Uh, we start to look at developing our, our max strength. That then fed in with our top-end acceleration and our speed work. Our exposures obviously came down in terms of our gym work, purely because we were at a three-week block and not that four. And as we work, so we're just at the end of this block now. As we're going into block three, uh, our conditioning is going to be, because we're looking at pre-season games now, really. The first uh, week we get in is our first pre-season game. Um, what we're looking at now is take, taking our conditioning off feet and looking to drive some elastic conditioning through that. And then we still get our match play and our conditioning on field running uh, work done in our rugby sessions. That again is a, a three week block with our exposures. But within that, because we're looking at that block approach, we can go back and look at our program and see if we get in the dose we need. And if it's for guys looking at our max, max strength, have we put enough exposure into them to get what we need or do we need to run that block for slightly longer? And again, it's our luxury of, of having this pre-season, which is longer, so actually we can do that, we can spend more time with that and still carry that you know, on into the season. Our speed blocks, what, we, and what we're looking at now is that ensuring that every, um, everything we're training, so regarding our speed work, our gym work and our um, on-field work is all underpinning the same goal for that block. So in our, uh, touch upon it uh, in the previous slide, just looking at our first three-step acceleration because we had the time to do it. So we're looking at a lot, a lot of um, acceleration ladder drills, projection drills to ensure the players are getting out there. So what you find in our game is that players are continuously um, having to accelerate. So whether that's ball carry, coming off the line of defense, um, what we need to make them as efficient as possible at those first three steps. Now, because players always start in a different position as well, what we the biggest thing we look at is manipulating that strain angle. So that came into a lot of our drills as well. Um, one, getting projection and getting yourself out there. But also, if there's one thing we're going to have to manipulate on the field, it'll be a strain angle to then drive horizontally and, and get over those first three steps. Half season to block two, looking at our top end acceleration, so rolling excels into our wicket runs. So we start to change our emphasis for our max velocity running, start to look at what exposures we're getting over a certain percentage of our max velocity. We're starting now to look at our top position, so our hip position and our max velocity running, but also our strike on the, on the deck um, within that position as well. Now, this wouldn't change, so in terms of a squad, as we were earlier, the range of play we have, so 130k tight head prop to a 85k outside back, we still need to expose our players to max velocity running, regardless if you're a tight head prop or you're, um, you're an outside back. To some point in the, during the game, uh, our players are going to be expected to, to get up that. And it's the intent to be able to get into that max velocity. Um, we need players to get up there. One, because we want to obviously drive, want to drive performance. But as we look to our exposures, obviously we, we look at injury prevention and get over 90%. We ensure that we're still getting those exposures. And that's where we start to put in now our wicket runs, um, yes, it's sub-maximal, but we're still driving technique and it sets us up exposure-wise as we go into block three when we look at our, our flies. Well, also, we'll, we'll look to develop within those blocks is our open, open skills. So we're looking at um, manipulating times on the field or uh, scenarios on the field where special outside backs will find themselves in one-on-ones and looking to try and get on the outside of someone with enough space to get our exposure also. So again, how our um, strength and power underpins this. So I spoke in the last one how 
you know, everyone will run max velocity. That is live off our GPS work. So again, it goes back to um, how we're integrating all the technology we can. So strength and power, that's all integrated with our push system. But also our max velocity when it's integrated with our GPS system, where we're getting live data straight away. So looking to get guys over 90% in their max velocity running. Um, any over 100% for us, obviously, it was a PB for them, and, and that's their speed session done. But what this does is that it underpins our philosophy from the start that the you know, strength underpins, power dominates, but speed kills. And within our blocks, everything within our block underpins where we are with, within, so block one, block two, and block three. If we're looking to drive acceleration and, and maximal strength or um, acceleration, reactive strength, top end acceleration, everything underpins that from our strength, power, uh, speed, condition, and so on. So if you look at our strength and power, we looked at our strength endurance block, both lower body and upper body. Max strength, we're in now. We just finished our first block of max strength work. And then for, good, for, for players, we can move into that third block. Uh, if we've got enough exposure, so we're in the process of that now. We'll work the strength speed blocks, more explosive work, and then we'll still hold on to that max strength of the body. Into our jump and plyo work. Now, everyone within this, each player has a set ceiling regarding the jumps and plyos. Again, we look at guys who are 130K, 125K second row, for example, is that they need to have a ceiling in terms of where the jumps are. To be fair, our forwards are you know, incredibly athletic in terms of our second row and back rows. Uh, they can work into reactive jumps and multiple bounds and so on. Just to be careful in terms of setting the ceiling and where we are for our big heavy guys. So our first block, everyone went off a non-reactive block to underpin that first three steps. We're looking at having the ability to accelerate. Uh, we just finished our reactive intro block, so looking at drop jumps, reactive steps, and, and our depth work for some guys. And as we work back in now, underpinning our max velocity work, um, we're working to our reactive blocks so multiple drops and, and multiple bounds. Again, it goes back to you know, what we're driving and how does that fit into our program? How is it underpinned across the board? So this is where you know that changes like when we go into our in-season approach to programming. So within that, uh, as you can see from our three groups, we got three groups, and the names are <laughs> incredibly corny to be fair. But what you, in that group you know where you're getting from it. Um, we got a mutant group, guys need to get stronger. A bulk group, guys need to get faster or move external load faster. Then we got our army group. Now. Within this, we run an auto-regulation system in season. Uh, that is underpinned hugely by our push system, our velocity-based training system, purely because if you're looking at an auto-regulation system, I introduced this when I was back at my previous club, say, about four seasons ago. And what I found straight in is that you create more buy-in for players who are playing a, a hugely demanding sport. Uh, they're coming in and you know, we say to them, look, train as, as good or hard as you can today, because that's going to be different week to week. I touched base on it a little bit further onto the presentation, looking at um, percentage base, but because again it goes back to we can't 100% control the fatigue the guys going to be playing or carrying into the next week because of a game. It also means that we can now be in a position where we can start manipulating our days and our groups to to what we need to get out of them. So in that, run a vertical integration approach. So again, back to Charlie Francis. Um, Everyone within this will have a separate group, so everyone will have their, their groups, but also within your group, your emphasis um, will just change block to block. We don't come away from everything completely, but your objectives, you'll have a primary objective and, you, and you, that's the number one goal for that block. Well, what also keeps by just keeping three groups is that I've tried it before and we've done it before, you had everyone had their own programs. So you can have up to 20 guys in the gym, you could be the only s &C guy, and guy. Within that, you've got 20 different things going on and you're chasing your tail in terms of trying to get through your programs with your guys instead of into your rack and coaching. And that's where, again, if you've got, we use the portal, but also the guys, all their programming is off, off our devices is that their programs, they, they're into it and I can just get into the racks and I can coach. So within our program, everyone has two objectives. Uh, so as a primary objective and a secondary objective. If you're in the mutant group, so again, guys need to get stronger, obviously number one, improve your strength. Secondly, increase your muscle mass. So again, we're still a contact or collision sport. Um, guys need that for robustness and protection in terms of getting multiple contacts and being able to back not only games up, but training weeks and, and longevity within the sport as well. Now, within these groups, um, all players have their own modifications. So 
we get guys in our group for us go to basic lower body strength movements, uh, back squat, front squat, box squatters, dead, straight bar deadlift, hex bar dead, guys who push and pull a heavy prowler. So everyone has a, a different strength movement, primary strength. Um, but what we still want to do, we still want to drive those guys to get strong within that movement and everything within it is measured. And what you'll find within these groups is that we have to go about it two different ways in terms of getting those primary safety objectives, purely because of uh, guys playing. So for example, if we get a player who's playing every week, we're going to have to newly stimulate that player um, to ensure that we get an adaptation in terms of improving strength. Because the second option in terms of um, giving more than more volume to increase strength just isn't an option because they haven't got enough to, time to recover from those higher volume sessions to ensure then that we can make sure they're going into a game day three, three days later, for example, ready to play and play as best they can because ultimately we're a sport where guys have to be optimally ready to play and, and win every game. That's, that's our objective. We want to go and win every game. Uh, within our measures, so get our objectives, how we're going to do it, then our measures, we have two measures for that block. One, it makes the player accountable in terms of making sure we get enough of our program, but also makes coaches accountable to ensure that we're being clinical in terms of what we're programming. So we do this for our low velocity profile. Every player across the board when he's tested pre-season will have low velocity profiles um, across their primary strength, strength work. And everyone will be low velocity profile on a hex bar jump as well, because everyone in our squad can hex bar jump. You'll get guys who can hex bar jump, they'll clean. Um, some guys will do from a hang variation, some guys will do a barbell squat jump, but we know that everyone can hex bar jump, so we can prepare like for like. They'll also then uh, look at the increase in the lean body mass, and we get that through obviously our body comp data. Uh, our second group, our bolts. Number one is the increased speed. Uh, second objective, increase the, the ability to for, produce force or rate of force development. Now, for example, if, if you've got a forward, whose number one job or you'll find that their contact area is a lot more common than a back, you'll put that increased RFD to their, their primary objective. And then increased speed, we're just looking at increasing the exposure to speed. So they'll, they'll push that exposure to then give themselves a stimulus to obviously drive that as well. So if we're looking at increase uh, our RFD, RFD test, we look at low velocity profile, again, hex bar jump, or our, uh, if we look at our jumps as a, as a CMJ as well, and then our max velocity sprint. With our max velocity sprint, that is done through our meets per second. So we collect that uh, through our GPS. So you'll do that through the flies, or we can do that through speed gates also. And the guys in the army, these are guided guys, and we need to get bigger. Um, mostly some forwards fall, fall into this. So we're looking at some back rowers who fall into this. We need to increase the lean body mass. These, these might be strong guys but we have to increase the lean, lean body mass to, again, go back to being robust enough to, to back up games. Um, we can either do that by higher volume of, of training or we increase their calorie intake. So, again, it goes back to if they're playing or not. If they're not playing, we know we can double up on their sessions. If they are playing, we'll front load their week with more calories. That means there's still in the surplus come in the week. We don't particularly want to be doing that close to game day because certain players have a certain routine in terms of eating. So we're trying to do that as far away from the game as we can within that week. Then we know we're still getting you know, um, a plus in terms of their calories. Number one for them is for if they're looking to increase lean body mass, again, goes back to their body comp data and then their load velocity profile in terms of improving their strength. So within this, you can see the guys have individually, it's their individual sessions, everything is measured, but within that also, we're keeping as much continuity through our session as we can one, so we can coach and we can be on the gym floor coaching, but also we can drive some competition within, within our training as well. So if we're looking at how we'd um, manipulate or looking at our force velocity curve in terms of those groups. Now, as we know that, like we got guys in our group who are grind, or we call them grinders. So guys who terminal velocities would be quite low. So if you're looking at a back squat, you might get a, um, it's usually a heavy, so... Again, let's go back to a tight dead whose terminal velocity on his back squat might be a 0.19. And then we'll get another tight dead who's a big power athlete and his, his terminal velocity might be 0.25. And obviously, when we prescribe then bar speeds um, for their primary lift, so for their maximal strength, we'll be in and around that 0 0.4, 0 0.45. If we need to bring that down for some guys who would, so our grinders, we bring that down to 0.5. 
three five for example and some of the other guys who might might push that up what it does give us is a basis to start and then it's underpinned by the bbt program to ensure we're training what we think we're training and ensuring we're getting the stimulus we think we're getting accessory lift will be in and around that strength speed and that dynamic lift again in and around that strength speed for our bolt guys our primary lift we're just moving more to the velocity base uh, of the curve so accelerated strength around that 0.65 Again, it goes for those guys. Uh, some guys who are in that group and need to get a little bit quicker or move things quicker are going to be strong guys. So we can start to manipulate that a little bit. And that's based on an individual basis. So with using this system, or using a one and auto regulation system, but a VBT system, you need to know your players extremely well. Um, and then it's a relationship with you and your player to know where they, where they are. Because ultimately what underpins this is that you're going to get some players who... Um, want to use the system the system is great but on Sundays we'll try and manipulate that system and try and you know when they um, say they're not feeling great but the bar's moving extremely well if the VBT system wasn't wasn't in place there those players probably wouldn't get out what we need to get out of that system so if anything it backs us up and we can start driving it from there accessory lift around uh, speed strength 1.3 then the dynamic lift in and around that, that 1.3 So why, it uh, goes back to why we try and essentially in, in the off, uh, in in-season, how we try and manipulate that, our force velocity curve across, even if a guy's in the strength group, in our mutant group, he's still going to have exposure to um, high bar speed to his, to his dynamic work and he's still going to have enough volume to hold on to some mass as well. It goes to why we do that. I think as a sport, I think you've seen all that, across a game every player again let's go back to our tight head prop on our outside back is going to be exposed to every every one of these so we're looking at our maximal strength our in the scrums if we're looking at uh, tight head prop or front row guys see a, a scrum goes for 10 seconds in an isometric position there's so much force that's produced in that we need to ensure that the guys can again dominate in that position not just hold the scrum but be able to dominate in that position but you'll also get that when an outside back has to carry the ball you know, into contact. And he could be going up against a guy who's bigger than him. So ensure that he has got strength behind him to be able to, one, underpin it, but then dominate that, that contact area as well when he needs to. As you can see, as we work down our curve, um, what comes into that is our strength speed movements. So we're looking at rocking, tackling, attacking the game lines. So again, goes back into that ball carry. And out and out power work. So coming off a line and getting into a positive tackle. Our guys in the line so our second rowers, who've got to have the ability to get up in the air, so produce force, and our ball carrying, and having the ability to break the gain line, so our speed, strength, and then our out-and-out -out pace guys, having the ability to get away from defences, and when they get the, the opportunity to get into a line break, or we get in the kick chase, the guys are up there, and we're up there near enough our max velocity to be able to um, underpin or collect those, those big moments to collect points in the game. So, you know, that's a little uh, look at terms of how we run our system and, and how we program. Ultimately, what, what underpins our system. Um, but then the biggest thing that underpins is obviously why we use uh, VBT and uh, the last couple of years or so, how push is integrated within that with not only the, the, um, the bands, but also our portal as well. So for us as our philosophy, unless we're tracking bar velocity, it's not possible to know what we're training. And it really is as simple as that. So what we think we're training, we could be completely way off. Um, so when we've got the technology, why wouldn't we use it to ensure that we're training what we think we're training? Because we get such, you know, three sessions a week with players and sometimes two sessions a week, we need to be really clinical in terms of what dose we're providing those players to make it individual to what they need. Um, because essentially we need to make the players as good as they can be come game day. So we need to know well, what we're training, what we're programming, and, and what we're getting back. So it goes back into you know, tracking our bar speed, our process of programming, and knowing what, who is in what group and, and, and what we're getting back from it as well. So I just touched base on a, on a few things. Standouts of why we use uh, BBT, why it underpins our program. And you know, number one is intent. Our game is, is dominated by how, how uh, high bouts are playing. So within that, 
Um, the key moments in the game, as I talked about earlier, uh, dominant carries or coming up off the line and stopping tackles, stopping people behind the game line. And the rate in which our players can move load is only going to underpin this. And what we want to be in a position to is not just you know, cope with what the physical demands of our game are, but excel at them. And it goes back to our first slide in terms of underpinning our, our department philosophy is that we need to dominate on a field. And when we go back to you know, worst case scenarios, for example, so in a game of rugby, you no know, a worst case scenario, um, there's two ends of a spectrum for a worst case scenario, as in any sport. So you can apply this to any team sport or an individual sport is that for us, we have a worst case scenario of a total ball in play time of one bout. That's the total duration the ball is in play without just getting, stopping or getting a rest. So uh, last year for us, that was up to six and a half minutes. And then we get the other end of the spectrum, which is the uh, biggest intensity we need to be able to cope with. So for example, we could have to cope with 200 to 220 uh, meters per minute within the game. And within that, within those worst case scenarios, we need to start putting in what the contacts are for certain positions within those, within those uh, worst case scenarios. So we could get a four minute bout, for example, where players have to cope with um, 170 meters per minute. So for some guys, some of our outside backs, but they might have to only carry the ball twice in that, maybe once or make one tackle. But then for the same bout, we could get back rowers who would only have to cope with potentially up to 130 of that, 130 meters per minute. But they might have to hit three rucks in that, make four carries and two tackles. So those worst case scenarios are different from player to player. But it's what those worst case scenarios actually what dominate games and dominate results of games. Because once they come along, it's what happens after those bouts that we want to be able to excel at. And again, it goes back to excelling, not coping. We need to put our players in a position where um, they're getting exposed to those game demands in training and past those game demands. So when it comes to game day, they've not only been in it, but they're used to being in it, they're comfortable being in it, and they're comfortable excelling in it. And that, that comes to intent. So if we look at you know, intent of, of driving a bar, you know, so we know there's, there's plenty of studies in uh, 2014, but they will put a study out looking at intent of bar speed in a bench press across six weeks. Um, one group, we're looking at maximum intent, move the bar as fast as you can. And the other group, we're just a control group, come in a bench. Three way, there's over a six week period, there's a 10% difference in terms of strength gains between, that, between those two groups. So if we're looking at a sport which is dominated by high collision, high bouts of play, we need to ensure that every time we get an opportunity to, to uh, either in the gym or, or out on field, the players are given the opportunity to have maximum intent, and that's where we're going to get our transfer and our carry over you know, onto the field. Second huge thing for us is feedback. So that this is underpinned through, obviously, now we're, with push, we can give feedback on, on pretty much any movement. But for us, we, we focus on our primary movements. Uh, we focus on our lower body lifts, um, lower body primary lifts, our dynamic work, and uh, our primary upper body lifts in terms of our gym work and our jumps. Straight away, you know, these players are competitive beasts. And straight away, they want to make everything competitive. They want to beat the guy in the rack. And that's what we want, because ultimately that's what it's going to be like on the field. As soon as you get the players feedback in gym, what we're talking about, about our max velocity work on field, as soon as that's live, players go harder and they want to win. And that's great for us, because if we're looking at getting one percenters out of players, straight away we get that by them coming in straight away and the push band's already on the bar for them to go over on field and GPS is giving them live, live data back in terms of their, their speed sessions, max velocity or if we're looking at a certain intensity of our, of our training to ensure that when we come to game day, again, those worst case scenarios, we're excelling at them. Players want to know, and then we get straight away as an increase in performance. So, you know, looking at, uh, as a summary, why we use it, uh, goes back to our, our testing. So we'll be mentioned in pre-season, we'll test everyone across a load velocity profile within their primary movements. We can compare individual athletes regarding those movements as well. So if we got, again, it goes back to our, our grinders and our power athletes, what we're getting at those guys and how we manipulate um, our training schedules and show those guys are getting what they need and what group they're going into. So our mutants, our bolts, or our arnies. We can, now we estimate, now from that, we can estimate our, estimate our one rep maximum or maximal loads. Obviously, that feeds then into our, our readiness to train. Only gets underpinned when 
when we're looking at our auto-regulation system within season, that if I'm prescribing an RP8 and there's, say, four sets of triples on a, on a back squat and I'm prescribing RP8, and I know players are, uh, they, my players know that that's leaving two reps in the tank. I know that from the estimate of where I am before and off those some maximal loads, when these guys are getting through their warm-up sets, I can see where they are for, for that day. You're going to get some guys who are ready to go. Maybe they haven't played on the weekend. They come in day one and they're ready to go. Those are weeks we cash in. Uh, if they come in the next week, they play on the weekend. Monday morning we come in, it's our, it's our lift. And they're not quite there. They know that then even for that day, we're still monitoring them but also they train as hard as they can for that day. And they try and get between you know, 5 and 10% of that, that week before. And we still get those you know, marginal gains where they come in, we train as hard as we can. Again, we get intent. So increasing performance through feedback across, across everything we use. We could put that, even with our guys who are into med ball work. So instead of just having that distance now, we can look at how fast we're moving that. Again, it goes back to intent because ultimately our game is dominated by being able to move or uh, again dominate external load so another player or yourself into into contact and you know, for us understanding that that uh, force velocity curve is essential to determine our strength emphasis for individual player basis so again how they fit into our groups how we're going to manipulate that to get what we need out of that player to make sure it's bespoke to them whilst also keeping that continuity within our sessions and us being able to coach So how push has been used within our program? Um, you know, might have seen the, the the video that went out from push in terms of how we use it. Uh, again, it goes into driving our environment and it underpins it, especially with the portal now, how that makes all our whole process more efficient. But what, what we base it off is this, it's essentially collecting what we should be collecting, not collecting everything for the sake of having data, but knowing what we're going to use. Uh, through our load velocity profile, which I sp spoke about previously, it gives us the ability to estimate our daily one rep maxes and measure our fatigue when we're lo loading those guys sub maximally. You no, know, for us, when we measure guys um, in terms of our load velocity profiling, we know what we're going to get from it. But the guys in the process now, because we've done it a number of times, they know how they're tracking and then they want to know what, what group they're going to go in. Because ultimately, for us, everyone wants to be in the bulk group. Because guys in our sport want to be strong. But then they know that what makes a difference on the field is moving themselves and other things um, really fast. And that's, and that's what we want to get to. So everyone wants to be in that bulk group. So that when we're testing guys or when we're in the gym and we're looking for intent, we know we're going to get it. Uh, we, again, we can test some hex bar jump, primary lower body lift, and our primary upper. That could be across, um, again, we spoke about our lower body work, but for our primary upper body work, uh, bench press, some guys overhead press, or we even get a Viking press with some guys who struggle with some overhead mobility work. And then we collect a terminal velocity for each player. Now with that you know, terminal velocity, terminal velocity, what it gives us is that when players are coming back from injury, is that you know everyone, especially in our um, especially in rugby, everyone's criteria to get back to playing is or oh, how strong was he before? But as we spoke about, that's not what makes a difference for us on the field. Now strength is makes people robust enough. But what dominates is, is having the ability to produce force. Now, I want to know, yes, how strong a guy is, but how, far, how fast is he moving that? So it goes back to his max velocity running, but then his bar speed on his primary lifts and his dynamic work. So we go back to our hex bar jump low velocity profile. Where was he before and where is he now? And then we can build upon that. So essentially, essentially then it starts um, making it easier for our process for then what group that, that player goes into. And is he in a position where he can go onto field after being coming back from injury and perform optimally. Well, what also, and this is um, probably for myself, is that when I started looking at uh, VBT or sorry, four or five years ago, when the first push band came out and run my own study when I was at my previous club, looking at you know, a percentage-based approach and then an auto-regulation-based approach and split my, I was looking after the forwards, so I had probably 25 guys splitting down the middle in terms of the, what, what do we get from this? And I think by using this, this program or using push in our system and using the portal, 100% has changed our thought process as coaches. And I think it should, like in terms of our traditional approach to, to percentage-based, and you know, I talked about it with our, how our pre-season differs to our in-season, where you can be um, really clinical in terms of what you give uh, pre-season, that the loads can be really concentrated in that, that traditional block approach. But I don't think we can hold on to that 
in terms of our block approach in, in season, which we spoke about um, players coming in and percentages feeling different. Now, for me, percentage-based training in, in season, especially in our sport, where the demands are huge, is, is flawed. And um, you know, I've, I've done enough uh, research, obviously, when the first band came out and compared it to other VBT devices and how our players bought into a programme and what we were getting actually from our programme. And 100% our programme, one buy-in from players, um, strength and, and power gains across our, pre, across our, our season was much better as well in terms of comparing those two groups. And the reason was is that we can say to a player, train as well as you can today. We need intent. Here's your feedback. Let's go and train. Now, again, it's what we're really, if a player comes in and he's sore, I can still prescribe our loads, go off our bar speed, and we can still get what we need to get from that day. He comes in the next week and he's ready to go and he trains hard. And those are the days we cash in. I think, you know, instead of saying, look, you need to be at 80% today, and that 80% actually feels like 90%, 90% plus percent, because you just come off a two, day to, uh, two days off after a game, where he's playing 80 plus minutes. Um, I don't think it works. So it definitely changes our thought processes as a coaching group. Prior to coming to the Ospreys, I'd already done that for myself, but we see it now integrating our department and our, not only our s department, but our physical therapy department, how that's been integrated in our thought process of what our players need to come back like and what we're going to measure for our players to come back like to ensure that we're going onto the field, again, excelling at the demands. So how push is integrated into our system? So uh, previously before uh, using the portal, so we you know, had the bands for a number of years, um, but not the portal. I actually find that we were using three or four um, different softwares to collect all our data, but now actually it makes my job a lot easier um, in terms of having you know, 40 guys on a system where I can program for everyone, put them into the schedule and everything's on, on one. So I can program, get our training done, get our data collection live, and then it all reports back for myself. So we're not going um, separate softwares, so not programming off a, an Excel, we're not collecting the data off a Google Sheet and then trying to feed it all back in everything's there and everything's interactive so everything's accessible to, to whoever needs to see it. it makes our process a lot easier um, and it makes it more efficient in terms of everyone seeing our performance program so we look at the basic um probably a lot of you would have seen this but how, how we then use the portal to program so top right and corner in terms of our, our builder how we split our blocks so we go into lower body and upper body blocks split our forwards and backs and then we start looking at how we're splitting our groups so our front row guys are being that, and our second row guys. It's so easy then for us to assign our mutant sessions and our bolt sessions to individual players. We can just assign the session, and then we can edit as we go. So, for example, if I want to go into my schedule, and I can edit week two straight away and assign it to a player, especially if, again, we go into that back to that off-season, the players are away, it's straight to them. They, for players who want it, they've got the individual sign-in. They can see their sessions, or they can see what's coming up. If we go uh, top left hand corner, just looking at how we edit that. So for this session, for example, we had our drop jumps, hex bar jump. Uh, this is for uh, one of our second row guys. Our back squat, our single leg Andersons and our hypers. You know, we know if a game's coming the next week and I need to just manipulate a little bit of that or if he's not going to play, I can then change that straight away and then it goes onto his schedule. Yeah, as you see, this is an example of one of our players uh, looking at you know, how we then schedule into it to his block makes it easy for my for my calendar where I can just schedule that in, change the schedule if needed. And if we go in for that again, that high low approach, we don't know a player's gonna come in for that first day, I can easily just change our session so it's live. So for example, if that's a Monday morning and we've we're looking to do a high day, but players are still sore from that game and they come in on a uh, on a Monday and they're still sore and we've got to move that to a low day, I can straight away drag that session over and then we just manipulate those days and go low high which we you know it's so easy to do just drag it across and, and have the ability to just change that as an ad hoc basis so within our environment uh push and enable us to drive our coaching process and with the features that probably other um uh, softwares haven't got that we can tie everything in uh, especially by having the device and the portal working together um interactively it's a lot easier for everyone to just sign into that and be able to see what the plan is um, limited time during season we need our sessions to be exactly what our players need at that point so for our mutant guys we know we're going to get we know we're training 
they know their bar speeds. Also, we know uh, what we want to be getting out of that session. With our live data, we can then change things if we need to. Because we've only got two, sometimes three sessions in that week. We need to have the ability to change what we need to get out of that session to keep driving our performance in season. As I said, before we were using the portal and the bands, um, we had to program off different and input, analyze different uh, off different softwares. Now we can just coach. I just want to get onto the gym floor. For those two hours I get them, I want to be able to coach and be in the racks with them. And whilst being interactive, um, it's enabled us to put our program across all departments. So our head of medical can sign into push. You'll see what you know, um, what our plan is, not just for that day, but then you know, the coming, coming block. And then that starts our conversation. We start changing things if we need to change things and make an individual you know, to that player. So just a, a quick one on what, you know, as a department, we want to be able to do. So we want to be clinical of what we do. We get limited time. We need to be clinical of what we do, ensure the players are getting what they should be getting, but also ensure we've got continuity within that. Players are coming in, the guys who are in the mutant group, they are getting that. We know our, um, uh, our measures, we know our outcomes. Just ensure that we're getting that, number one, and then we can start driving that program for that, play, for that um, player so we can spend two or three blocks within that mutant program and then move into the bulk. Because like I said earlier, ultimately all our players want to be in the bulk. What are we training and why? Again, being clinical of what we're doing, going back to our process or our philosophy as a department, where's our player on that pathway and where, where do we want them to get to? And being able to do the basics extremely well whilst utilising the specialists within our department. So before um, coming into this, this role as head of physical performance, I was... Uh, predominantly seen as like a strength guy so we do all the programming for our, our gym work we also have um guys within our environment s and c coaches who are extremely good and stand out and say their speed emphasis and their, their speed programming once we program together we can ensure that everyone's skills are being utilized essentially we get we're getting the basics done extremely well while still trying to drive some innovation within our department as well um Sorry if I got a little bit over and on a few uh, tangents. Um, thank you very much. Uh, if anyone wants to touch base in terms of things I've spoken about or um, things that you've done and you you do in your environment and you think that we could implement that, you know, with us, the Ospreys, um, we're more than happy to collaborate if if people wants to touch base. Um, here's my email. Uh, please feel free to give us give me some feedback also with that or. You know um, if there's things you want to touch base on or ask more detail with. Like I said before, we're really transparent in terms of what we're trying to do. Um, and if there's a little more detail you want, then you know, that's, that's, that's fine from us. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Simon. It was extremely insightful, extremely informative. Um, I'm, I'm sure I, all of our listeners learned a lot. Uh, we'd like to open it now up for, for a Q&A roundtable style. We have about 10 minutes left. Um, so for all those who have any sort of questions, just fire them into the Q&A um, tab down at the bottom and we'll get Simon to answer them uh, live for us here. So uh, please feel free to go ahead and uh, enter in some of your questions. Just while we're waiting for people to, to write in, so Simon, I actually had one as well. Just how, how have you guys been managing things with the World Cup um, squad players? Have they kind of been bouncing in and out of the team? and? Uh, have you guys also had them on the push kind of side of things while they've been in camp or how, how have you guys managed that? Uh, can you hear me guys? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's a strange one for us with, with the world cup. Um, for us at the moment, we've got uh, 13 guys away at the world cup. We've got 11 guys up with Wales and then uh, one out with Tonga and one out in Namibia. The, for our preseason, um, yes, it's, Th those guys have been integrated into our portal and our, our system through our programming. When they go into those international environments, that's then obviously slightly different in terms of what they're looking to drive within that those phases because it's completely different. When they're coming through, you know, for us, our blocks wouldn't fit into in terms of what we want those guys going into World Cup back because as soon as our World Cup day one comes, those guys need to be ready to go. A huge competition phase, probably one of the biggest, biggest blocks of some of those guys' careers. Um, so it'll be slightly different to us because you know, we're looking at a World Cup, we're looking four weeks of really high intensity or six weeks of really high intensity uh, play where we've got a nine to ten month season. Um, but yeah, absolutely in terms of what, what we'd or what those guys need to, need to cope with, they'd be within our environment. So those internationals, when they come back to us, they'll be integrated back into how we run it. Um, there's obviously good, there's great collaboration between us and the, the national coaches in terms of 
what we're looking to drive. Um, but then we'll be given a this conversation in terms of how we need those players going into that World Cup as well, because players come off the back of a tough season with us. Um, so if you think of an international player, they've gone Six Nations camp. So Wales have had a huge Six Nations camp. Play Six Nations, they come come back to us for the end of the season. We have some huge games. They get a short off season and then they're into camps with national squad. So for example, they just played two games against England. Prior to that, they were out in Switzerland for a camp and now they're out in Turkey for a camp as well. So the demands for them are huge, but off of that shorter, shorter time period. But then you can drive that intensity. You can, again, go back into being really clinical of what you're trying to get out of it. Awesome. Great. Um, cool. Okay, so we'll go on to the um, attendee uh, uh, questions. So the first one that we've got is, um, so how do, you, how do you kind of incorporate uh, VBT principles and just velocity-based training in general um, with your rehabbies, like so people coming back from injury? So yeah, that's, that's where having those, those profiles on players enables us to always be able to go back to that. So within our rehab guys, um, they'll still use the, the portal as, as we would with a player who's playing every week. Um, it means f for me that, so we have a, um, a head of rehab S&C coach who's extremely good, who, who uses the portal and it means that then I can just sign the portal and see what those players' plans are and see what we get from it. Those players will be just as integrated um, within our system. They'll still uh, say someone's upper body injured. They'll still load velocity profile and lower body work because um, I think we need those markers. When those players come back, it goes back to not just making sure guys are strong enough to play, but what their outputs are, where things are going to make a, a real difference on field, um, ensuring that they're in the right position to come back and play. All right, Simon, we got another question here. Um, may I ask how you're measuring body composition and how do you determine that a player needs to increase lean body mass? Uh, so body comps, uh, we're lucky enough with the Welsh Rugby Union where all our supplements of body comps are covered off. We get um, nutritionists from Welsh Rugby Union come in and it's all collated as, as four regions. Um, so regular body comp test, uh, seven, seven body comps. And then we'll go back. So it's the same test every, every time it's the same, same person that comes in and does that. Now, within that, looking at someone who needs to increase lean body mass, we'll base that purely off where we have markers. So for, um, now everyone's different in terms of that. So in terms of the lean body mass, or if we're looking at increasing lean uh, or weight on a player, obviously you're going to get some <coughs> mute in that. So now we go back to our mutant group. Our biggest guy carry lean body mass up at about 110 kgs. So from being in the environment, you know that guy doesn't need to put on any more lean mass. Uh, so basically, it's ensuring that anyone who can't physically cope with either contact area or when those demands of the game come in, we know that that guy needs to put on a little lean mass. It's not just about, um, and in an ideal world, it's be like you know, the sayings, uh, strong is strong, big and strong, big and strong, strong is strong. So looking at, okay, by just getting someone bigger, people think that we aren't actually physically making them better to play rugby. But when the demands and the, are so huge for that sport, you know, that's what then comes back in. So it's a lot of it is knowing your player, knowing the sport really, and knowing um, ultimately we're going to have to put these guys in a better position to be robust enough to play. So there's no really set parameters in terms of right, we want our tight head props being up at uh, 110 because all our tight head props come in different sizes. You can get a 5 foot 10 tight head prop at 125 kegs and you could get a 6 foot 3 tight head prop at 130k. So it's totally different for those guys to be able to develop some lean mass. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Simon. That was, that was fantastic. Um, again, like I said, very insightful and incredibly informative. Uh, I'd just like to thank you and the Ospreys for allowing us to really get an insight into what you guys are doing and an extremely transparent insight at that. Uh, if any of you are interested in the UK and picking up a unit, please go visit our friends at uh, Absolute Performance UK. Again, Jack at aperformance.co.uk. And again, thank you so much, Simon. We appreciate it. And for any of those interested in the recording, uh, please reach out to either myself or Cedric at Bailey at trainwithpush.com or Cedric at trainwithpush.com. And we're more than happy to send you a recording so you can rewatch and, and relearn. So thank you all very much. Um, again, Simon and the Ospreys, thank you. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys at our next webinar.